Welcome to Toxic Sips podcast. I am Jess and I'm Sassy. This is Talks and Sips Spooky Sister. Yep. And in the last two weeks episode, we did give you guys some trivia questions and it's time for you to know if you got it right or wrong. So, we hope you guys participated. The first one, first question, which horror film's tagline is we dare you to say his name five times. And the answer was Candyman. Yep. And for episode two, it's what classic horror movie features a serial killer in a William Shatner mask? It was Halloween. <laughs> this week in our spooky adventure, we are covering true crime stories and Halloween across the world. Let's dive in the cauldron of bones. <laughs> well, I think I am up. Am yes. I up? Yeah. Oh, heck yeah, I'm up. Right, <laughs> let me put the little hat on my thingy. No, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, look at her cubs. Anyway. <laughs> Imagine having the last name Crafts. Surely you are destined for great creative things, you know? Being great with your hands, making cool art, yeah. um, articulately disposing of bodies. This is fun because it ties in a little bit with my pick. <laughs> Articulately. <laughs> in September 1986, Heli Crafts had had enough. She was done with her good for nothing man. I've been there, sister. Right, Cecilia? <laughs> Just kidding. We love you, Matt. Free Matt. <laughs> Yeah. However, she was tired of her man's lies, affairs, and general lack of effort towards their children and marriage. In the time frame, she had already met with a divorce attorney and hired a private investigator who confirmed that her man, Richard Kraft, was unfaithful. <laughs> so clearly, she had to take out her man. <laughs> well... <laughs> just kidding. The story is just getting started. As a flight attendant for Pan Am on November 18th, Heli was sitting in a long flight from Frankfurt, Germany to her home in a new town, Connecticut. She couldn't help but feel that awful feeling that we get when we start feeling anxiety. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> the weight of her impending divorce weighed heavily in her mind. So. How did this lovely couple meet, you may ask? They were just walking by each other. Just walking like, by. The one. She dropped the books on the floor. And, uh, <laughs> they touched hands yeah. while they were picking them up. <laughs> <laughs> Bumped heads on the way. Well, she met Richard in 1979 when she was training to be a flight attendant while he was training to be a pilot. They were good looking, jet setting, lived in a luxurious home on a two acre lot in Connecticut and had three children. Also, side tangent, I hate when reading historical retells or watching true crime shows and they were like, they had three beautiful children. Um, that's subjective, bro. What if they were ugly? Oh, but <laughs> I'm just saying. Everybody calls kids cute, even if they're not. <laughs> oh my gosh. The worst is when there's newborn babies and they look like oh, Martians. Oh, yeah. And I always tell people, I'm like, how do you say they look cute? They look like aliens. They look like aliens. <laughs> even like my own families, I'm like, they look like an alien <laughs> but they swear up and down yeah that it's an angel like oh it looks like just like uh his mom's like, like how <laughs> looks like a prune my guy <laughs> but anyway back to the show richard Kraft made good money but he was what we call in spanish a codo with his money therefore heli had to keep working she had to pay for family vacations and things for the kids she had a kiss I was going to say she, she had, had a, kiss. a kiss. No, she had a killer personality, though. She spoke four languages and had a really warm personality. I realize I said that twice in a different way. <laughs> Richard's cheapness. There was something in my mouth. Richard's cheapness paled in comparison to his other faults, either in their earlier marriage Oh, not either. Earlier in their <laughs> <laughs> Earlier in their marriage, Richard battled cancer and Heli was there for him. She had her partner's back. Richard was a serial cheater and would disappear for weeks at a time to be with his girlfriends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Richard also had a gnarly temper and became physically abusive. 
Sounds like a winner. <laughs> but hey, Ceci, maybe I don't want a pilot after all. Sorry, John Travolta. Sorry, John Travolta. <laughs> well, Helly started to fear Richard and told friends that if she ever disappeared, don't think it was an accident. That's why it starts getting very like, if because I don't know. I can't imagine any of my friends coming up to me and saying right? that. But like, what would I do? Like, I obviously, I'd get him out of the house, but... He would know. I don't know. Like, it's weird. <laughs> Am I going to get punched for this? YOLO. Yeah. For friendship. It's like if I came to you and I was like, hey, Matt, something is up with it. He knows where you live. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. But he knows my mother. Yeah. He knows everything. It's a tough, tough spot. Mm-hmm. But then, I don't know. We have cop friends. <laughs> <laughs> There's restraining orders. But that stuff sometimes doesn't even do it. No, anything. because the cops aren't there with you making sure they're like whatever feet away. <laughs> right. You have to have baller, baller status money for that. Yeah. So well, thankfully, have. Matt's not. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> People believe that Helly broke the news to Richard that she was leaving him on the night of November 18 after returning from Germany. So who do you think passed away here? Let's see. I'm just going to put some pieces together. So just based off of what you said, she was leaving him after returning from Germany. So let's add some drama that probably wasn't happening. Mm. What if she found someone over there? And because was he's like, a serial cheater? Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, I could leave him right now with the kids, take him out of here. And he's like, Mm-mm, I don't want anyone doing what I do to them. Mm. And the husband always does it. So... The husband always does it. <laughs> Why? Why, husband? Why do you always do just it? Just get a divorce. Get, like Cece says, just get a divorce. <laughs> no one's going to care. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, super, super side tangent. I was watching Shit's Creek the other day, and he's like freaking out because he has to take the DMV driven test. And the girl, his sister's like, dude, you're going to find out in life. Because he's like, I don't care how nonchalant you are about everything. You literally are weirdly never anxious. And she goes, you're going to realize that people just don't care. Yeah. <laughs> like you're worried about nothing and people don't give a fuck. And sure enough, he takes a test. And the guy he's driving with who's taking his test for him or like next to him, he's on his phone yeah. <laughs> yeah, the whole time. He's like, oh, yeah, man, you're good. Just turn left here. <laughs> and he's like, you really don't care. He's like, no, I'm trying to be a DJ. <laughs> So people don't care. No, they really don't. <laughs> so get a divorce. <laughs> anyway, so what happened next? What happened was the next morning, Richard. Oh, dang it. I gave it away. <laughs> On November 18th, 1986, Helly vanished. Mm, you almost got us with the beginning. Though. I know. I, was, I tried really hard. I was got to write this in a way where it can confuse you guys. Um, her body was never found. So what happened? Uh, the next morning, Richard woke up at the crack of dawn and drove the kids to his sister's house because a perfect storm happened the night before. Connecticut was hit with a massive storm that buried the town in snow. The power went out. The kids were like, Dad, where's Mom? And Richard just told them, she'll meet you guys later. But obviously, she never showed yeah. up. And I like how the kids are like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, the... N- when When she didn't show up for work her co-workers immediately suspicious you know they were like she's a responsible mom this isn't in her character to be a no call no show i feel like no call no shows it just means someone someone because someone (laughs) at some point someone was like i feel bad don't get me wrong. There are people who don't care. Oh, yeah. But if they're, like, known for being, like, super responsible, and once you, you get that no call, no show, something's up. Oh, my God. Yesterday, totally random. My brother never left his room. And it was, like, 4 p.m. And I was like, I should probably check on him. But then my mom calls me, and she's like, hey, do you want something from McDonald's? And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm like, ah, he's, he's fine. She's getting him a frap. Oh, okay. He called her already. <laughs> So I didn't bother. And sure enough, he comes out. I was charging my phone all morning. <laughs> so you never left your room? <laughs> Whatever, guys. I've had, I've had days like that, though. Not, like, not here, because I need to get out. 
<laughs> but like when I was with my parents, mm-hmm. or even when I was with my grandparents, I would just spend like days a day. in your room. Yeah, sometimes days. <laughs> she, she came out of her cave. I'm like, I have cereal in my room. It's fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm alive. There's water. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they were like, what's up? That's not like her. Yeah. You know, uh, they kept in mind, I think, what she said about Richard. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's very red flag ish. <laughs> Uh, people began asking questions, obviously. Richard's answers were always super invasive, not invasive, but evasive. <laughs> First, he said, I don't know where she is. And then she he was like, Helly's visiting her sick mother in Denmark. And then he followed it with, Helly's going on vacation to the Canary Islands with a friend. Which one is it, Richard? Which one is it? You said this was in the night. N- Eight, 90s or 80s? This was the 90s. 90s? Yeah. Okay. Because this sounds very familiar. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. It was in 86. Okay. So do you know, I think her name's Casey Anthony? I've heard. Sorry, not Casey Anthony, but she's bad too. That's her kid. <laughs> um, Chris, oh, I'm blanking on his name. But he basically did this too, but also the kid. So it's like the more recent version of this, and it takes it a step farther. Oh, I have heard of this. Chris, I want to say Chris Wallace, but I don't think that's his name. No, but I, I know what you're talking about. There was like a whole documentary on Netflix, something mm-hmm. like The Neighbor Next Door or something like that. Yeah, like it's crazy. And you're like, bro, just <laughs> like, go who to can counseling. I trust? <laughs> yeah. I can't trust no one. <laughs> um, yeah, which one is it, Richard? Which one is it? <laughs> um, this is why you need friends that will be those uncomfortable, honest, transparent friends, you know? The ones that you're like, I just want to vent, but they're like, but I got to fix your problem, bro. Um, shoot, if I was your friend, I would have been like, you better call me as soon as you break the news to him. Better yet, I'll park outside your house if I have to. And, you know, if you need to leave him, if mm-hmm. he's after, you know, acting out of pocket, if you right. will, then we, we got to dip with them kids. It's so, yeah, because I mean, I feel like a lot of people would act that way. But also, I, I don't know if you know this, but from what it seems like, I don't think she told anyone. Besides, like, giving, like, what he does, that's wrong. But mm-hmm. I don't think she told anyone that she was planning on leaving him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think the only one who really knew was um, the private investigator. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I think he was the only one. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that she... Because nowhere in the reading did I find, like, she had a friend, like, ready to go. That's why everyone was like, it's him. Because yeah, it was she, just, like... Well, what she was saying. <laughs> yeah. Because she wasn't, like... <laughs> saying saying if that makes sense yeah she was like hinting towards it but mm-hmm. not like straight up yeah i'm leaving okay yeah because the kids tough. a lot of like the kids you don't ever hear anything about them either they're just like oh i guess mom's dead y- yeah because <laughs> they're kids what are they gonna do <laughs> accuse their dad <laughs> right <laughs> But yeah, so like in that movie Enough with J-Lo, you need a waitress friend who's going to be there for you in the good times, but also the vulnerable times. Um, Her friends, frustrated, hired a private investigator. Seriously, a job for everybody. It's the ultimate cheese muscle. (laughs) The ultimate cheese muscle. (laughs) Ironically, using the same investigator Heli had used originally on her husband. Mm. Mm. The investigator found out from the housekeeper that a few days after Heli's disappearance, Richard had removed moved a rug from the master bedroom the rug just happened to have a dark stained patch the size of a grapefruit on it mm, coincidence so <laughs> the investigator felt it fishy he pestered local police and finally like two weeks later the case was turned over to the state police she was finally declared a missing person richard claimed he had not left the house on november 19 but the lie detector on the credit card bill showed that was a lie because he had purchased new bedding he had bought a chest freezer and rented a wood chipper in the days before heli's disappearance um that's um, this doesn't sound like a, a crime of passion no <laughs> this sounds what is it premeditated premeditated <laughs> a very angry person <laughs> mm-hmm. forensics immediately found clues in the craft's home that pointed to foul play but also if that blood smear on the side of the bed didn't give it away man i don't know what will <laughs> also that blood was consistent with heli's type of mm. blood 
It's all the evidence is pointing in a certain direction. <laughs> what a coincidence <laughs> that a snowplow driver noticed a man with a wood chipper parked near Lake Zoe. Mind you, this was 3 a.m. and he was snowplowing the roads. And he says that the truck driver, you know, saw a U-Haul with a wood chipper hitched to the back and parked on the side of the road. He saw a man who was just like motioning him like, keep going. That's don't stop. Weird. Mm-hmm. At three in the morning. I know. Like, why would you? <laughs> Honestly, if he didn't do that, he probably wouldn't have even noticed him. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the driver thought a little of it. He was like, hmm. All right. I'm going to do my job. And he continued to plow the streets. Mind you, two hours later, he drove by again. And now the wood chipper was gone and the man. But the U-Haul was still there. And it was five in the morning. So. Suspicious. Suspicious. <laughs> Trigger warning, divers found a chainsaw and serrated cutting bar that had human hair and tissue embedded in the teeth. This led to a search for further evidence, which began on December 30th, 1986. When detectives searched along the shoreline, they found remnants of a woman's body, including tiny bone fragments, human tissue, over 2,000 blonde Blonde, blonde. Human, <laughs> bland, blonde human hairs, a dental crown, and a fingernail with pink nail polish. From the microscopic evidence, doctors were able to prove that Richard Kraft had disposed of his wife's body. The most important part of the remnants was a tooth cap that matched Helly's dental records. Gold dental records! Detectives began to stitch together... Hold on. Tangent. So for all those beautiful dentists out there that are trying to commit suicide, we need you. What? (laughs) Oh, there was this poll that was done a long time ago Uh that like did like any like if you're an artist, if you're a contractor of some sort, if you're whatever. And it was like from one to ten, what industry had the highest suicide rates? And number one was dentists. Oh, because. (laughs) People are never excited to see them. They always go in like, oh, like anxious, yeah. sad, angry, all the feelings. And so because of that, compared to like an orthodontist, an orthodontist, you're like, oh, OK, they're going to put rubber bands on me or whatever. Mm. But a dentist, you're, people always come in with fear. Like freaked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I get that. So sad. that's like, <laughs> imagine all day of that. Yeah. And all you're doing is helping create beautiful smiles. Yeah. And they're so like important too. like with a lot of these cases, like that's pretty much the only thing that because you could burn people but the teeth take like hours and it has to be super high for it to burn so that's like your last thing that you have gunning for you (laughs) right because they're your exposed bones Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) but yeah so and i think on that list of the suicide thing the second was like artists like singers that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> it was such a weird list. I was like, yeah. dentist. Yeah, dentist. I I understand that though. Like not feeling like your job is important, but it is it's so, so important. important. <laughs> we need you. These serial killers can't get away. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So detectives begins to sit together the events from that night. They believe Richard killed Helly in their bedroom. By striking her with a heavy object, he then put her body into a freezer. Once the body was completely frozen, he hacked her apart with a chainsaw, fed the pieces through a wood chipper, and dumped her remains in the lake. Hmm. I mean, that's that's an order of operations. Operations. If, if that ain't PEMDAS, I don't know what is. PEMDAS. <laughs> <laughs> to make things worse, Richard thought he was so smart because aside from being a pilot, he was an auxiliary cop. Newtown detectives knew Richard Crafts very well. He was an auxiliary cop for the police department since 1982, and he was a familiar figure around the police station. He had a reputation as a somewhat rigid patrolman who took his limited responsibilities very seriously. Uh, Therefore, he thought he was all that in a bag of chips. Mm -hmm. He thought he got away with the perfect crime. He had told his brother offhandedly, let them dive. Oh, wait, what does he sound like? Let them dive. There's no body. It's gone. Pretty strange comment coming from a man who claims to know nothing. Not only that, but it's your wife. Like, why would you be like, there's no body? Like, you're so set on not right? nothing being there of her. Like, freak. <laughs> uh, he actually even, well, you can't say he, right? Somebody <laughs> filed off the serial numbers from the chainsaw. He was covering all his bases. Yeah. With the evidence mounting, it soon became clear to investigators that Heli would not be found. 
She was disposed of in Lake Zor, but her body could not be located. Only remnants of her. Even without a body, authorities were able to theorize what had happened moments before she died. On January 11th, an arrest warrant was granted based on the evidence gathered thus far. Law enforcement ordered Richard out of the house, but he responded with, I'm tired. I'll take care of it in the morning. It took some time, but Richard finally relented and he was taken into custody and held on a bail of $750,000. And that's a lot. Three quarters of a million dollars. That's a lot. In 87, yeah, 88. So it's even more than that. Now. Mm, that's a lot. He thought he was a bad bitch, though. Let me tell you, girl, the evidence was mounting and it was becoming clearer and clearer that Richard had disposed of his wife. The prosecution moved forward, attempting to convict Richard without a body. And that was like unheard of at the time because you always need a body or up, up until this point. So the trial started in May of 1988 and was moved to New London, Connecticut. A number of witnesses were called to the stand, and this also reminds me of the series finale of Seinfeld when they got 10 years worth of people that they hurt along the way <laughs> because of their careless nature, and they all got them locked up at the end. <laughs> um, spoiler alert! Medical examiners also confirm the teeth and tissue found at Lake Zor had come from Heli. So, like, it's her. She's just all over the place. There was a ton of evidence, but one juror was being super difficult. The trial ended with a hung jury, and the courts were forced to hold a second trial. All evidence was brought forth one more time in Norwalk, Connecticut. After both sides had finished their arguments, the jury took eight hours to find Richard guilty of murder. This was the first murder conviction in the state's history where a body was not present. Richard still continues to deny any involvement in the murder of his wife, despite all of the evidence pointing in his direction. He's like, I don't do it. He was like in that song, saw me, how does it go? Saw me banging on the sofa. It wasn't me. That was basically his motto. <laughs> hey, Richard. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Um, until recent, a murder conviction without a dead body was nearly impossible. But as this case proved, it's more difficult than ever to get away with murder. Finally, he was released in 2019 for completing his time at the age of 82. He only served 30 of the 50 years he was sentenced. So I'm assuming because of good behavior and, and because not getting into trouble. Labor. Labor. Mm. Mm. All that community service. Commander <laughs> service. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently when he was arrested and convicted, at that time there was a different law put in place okay. where you they could honor it. It's like if you work and you do and you're just well behaved, you're good, mm. we're, you, we can cut your time in half. Okay. Now the rules are different. Yeah. Sometimes they don't even give like a... Uh, an option no like they're like even if you are you do end up being a good person you're not getting out <laughs> mm -mm. yeah so people were mad people were like what the heck but then they're like i mean what can we do he's done his time so um oh fun fact this inspired the making of the movie fargo this film won four Academy Awards and the Coens received Oscars for the Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Adapted Screenplay. Mm. So there you go. <laughs> Sad that an awesome movie had to be created through real inspiration, but uh, at least we got a movie. And it's not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be fitting to cover the infamous Edward Gein also known as Ed Gein, or the, what is he, the Butcher of Plainfield. He, if you didn't know, he was the inspiration for a few horror movie icons. You know, Leatherface mm -hmm. from Texas Chainsaw, Norman Bates, Bates Motel. You mean my brother and my mom? <laughs> <laughs> and Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. Another good one. So yeah, he was an inspiration for all of them, at least partially, not necessarily... For Buffalo Bill, it was kind of a mix of all of them, but the other two, you can understand why when we get to it. <laughs> so we're going to start off with his parents because his parents had a pretty like hard impact on them. As we are discovering, <laughs> everybody's parents. We're coming after everybody's yeah. parents. <laughs> no one's safe. No one's safe. 
<laughs> so his father, George, he was an orphan that came from like multiple unstable homes. It's just where he grew up. And he did grow up to be an alcoholic which made it hard for him to keep a job. And when he did have a job, he would spend most of his income like on booze Mm. because that's like what he knew to be. It's his world. He's just an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) This is a man's world. (laughs) Ed's mother, Augusta, she was raised in a very strict household and her parents had really hardcore religious beliefs, which you'll definitely see she sticks to. Also, they did not do her any favors with that name. Augusta. It's like Augustus Gloop from Charlie and Chocolate. That's not good, man. Even though I think this is, I'm pretty sure this is before Charlie and the the Factory. Um, (laughs) They seem like an odd couple, like to people, like even then that were living with them or in the same town as them. They're like, yeah, it's a little weird, but they figured it's because she can take advantage of him like she was very she was the one wearing the pants for the most part she was like verbally abusive to him and there'd be times where he would just go out drinking and then when he would come home he would be physically abusive so there was no winning there no and apparently when he was beating her she would get on her hands and knees like on the floor and she would pray to god like kill my husband right now while he's beating her (laughs) i don't know if it works like that uh no that's not a healthy relationship (laughs) obviously they had tons of issues and they shouldn't have been together to begin with but like a lot of people back then they dealt with certain partners because they wanted to start a family and that's Mm. what she wanted to so this is this is also pre-boomers i believe so this yeah this she i don't know when she was born but ed he was born on august 27th 1906 so that's early 1900s Mm -hmm. (laughs) his classmates and teachers remember him as like a super shy kid and he like he was a little odd uh one of the things they brought up is that he would just be sitting there like still doing whatever and he would just burst into laughter and when they asked him like what what's so funny he's like oh i'm just i'm thinking of some funny stuff and like i don't know if i would see that as like weird i think now it's so common yeah because like people talk to themselves like it's not as odd to look at it that way but yeah. back then they're like okay this kid's weird <laughs> they're like oh he's he was probably more self like aware more self-sure than anybody there yeah. to an extent (laughs) he didn't have any friends due to his mother because when like he tried to make friends at school but once his mom found out about it she would throw a fit and be like no like again going back to her religious belief she thought everyone was evil yeah Mm -hmm. you are evil yes (laughs) ed had an older brother named henry he was born in 1901 i believe so five years older than him and their mother he she was the same way with both of them and they would work on the 155 acre farm in plainfield wisconsin she would read the bible to them and preach that the world is inherently evil that all women except for her are prostitutes and that drinking and immorality were instruments of the devil so. she clearly just doesn't <laughs> know what having a good time is <laughs> So it is known that Ed and his mom were very close, which I think that's fine. But at some point, there has to be some kind of boundary set up there. Like, it's one thing to be a mama's boy. But if he said that his mother was his first love and his best friend, I've met people that are like, yeah, my parents are my best friends. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying they're your first love, like. But like he's just saying what all men are subconsciously thinking, right? And not ballsy enough to say no. And there, there's been a study that like men, when they're like hitting puberty, whether mm-hmm. they think of it this way or not, they're competing with their dad mm-hmm. to get the mom's attention. Like it's an actual study. Like so it's weird. not. Yeah, it's weird. But it, you shouldn't be thinking like, am I into my mom? <laughs> right. It should, your brain shouldn't go there. No, and it's the same thing with girls. Like. Typically, if you had a good father figure, you look for that in a man. Or even if he's not a good father mm-hmm. figure, like you look for that in, in a, a man. man. Not everybody. Same thing with not every guy is like that with like this with his mom. <laughs> but, but I think so. There's a difference, right? Because you were saying that the the young man competes with his father. Yeah. For the, you for know. the attention and love of the but, mother. But I also think it's not necessarily 
in like a sexual way. No, it's no. like in the hero way. Like yeah. a man needs to feel like I am protecting. Mm-hmm. I am. I am here to help you. No, yeah, and like they compete for her attention really mm-hmm. that's all it is like it's not like you said it's not they're like oh let me Ooh, seduce my mom <laughs> it's yeah. not like that it's, it's definitely very... the hero complex and that's why people like guys don't understand that that's what they're doing mm-hmm. sometimes and like people that have really dug into it and have like zeroed in on it they're like it's not weird like don't think you're being weird it's your mom like you're supposed to feel a certain way for her yeah and same thing with like girls and dads and then in other relationships like you know the phrase oh you married your mom or you Mm -hmm. married your dad like that's very real (laughs) dude don't get me started i there's some (laughs) friends that i have who have recently gotten married i don't talk to them they were they were part of a different part of my life Uh, yeah mm -hmm. um back in my audio days and Mm -hmm. like i see who they in like ultimately ended up marrying i'm like they look like your moms Mm -hmm. both of them (laughs) but the one of them was adopted oh that's weird. <laughs> I know. So crazy. Well, g- going off of that, <laughs> his father, George, did eventually die of heart failure, which, you know, I would have thought it was liver failure, but it was I would have gone with liver and kidneys for sure. <laughs> yeah. So he, he died when Ed was in his mid 30s. So Ed's life from like childhood to adulthood, it was pretty like, as normal as it was for him, like everybody knew he was kind of a little weird, but mm. they didn't think much of him. But Henry was very concerned for Ed as he himself, again, this is his brother. He had found a woman that he's like set on. He's going to marry her. They're going to move out and start their own lives together. She already had kids. So you can already imagine how the mom felt about that. Because <laughs> she was Dad, also what? divorced. No, no, no. <laughs> Um, But he did. He saw how unhealthy the relationship between their mom and Ed was. So he decided to confront Ed about it as a good brother. But Ed, he didn't like how he was talking about it. Their mom, because he's in love with their mom. Weirdo. Mm hmm. In 1944, this is four years after their dad died. Ed and Henry were working on the farm where they were burning marsh away, mm. but the fire got out of control and like they had to call the police and the fire department. They came out and they eventually put it out. But later that night, Ed went to the police to report that Henry was missing and he hadn't seen him since when the fire started. Mm. Mm-hmm. Coincidence. Coincidence. <laughs> so a search party, they went out there to the farm. They were looking for him and they did find him. He was dead. He was face down in like the mud. The interesting thing, though, is that when they like, uh, what's the autopsy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they did the autopsy, they're like, yeah, he's been dead for a while. (laughs) Like probably longer than this fire thing going on. (laughs) Um, But they said that the cause of death was heart failure like his dad. And later on, it was revealed that there were bruises on his head, which is a little iffy. Mm -hmm. The coroner did eventually mark asphyxiation. I pronounced it right this time. I was having a hard time yesterday. (laughs) As the cause of death, as if you didn't know, that's the lack of oxygen. Um, And they were trying to pin it on the fire because it's like, oh, all the smoke, like it it went into his lungs. And it's like, "Mm, was it that? Was it that? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like Thor. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> there's no proof of foul play but like i said there was bruises on his head how did those get there and many believe that this very well could have been ed's first victim due to the way he talked about their mom don't you ever tell me that my mom is not a precious sweet angel <laughs> yeah. okay a year after this because this is the 40s for them mm-hmm. it's tough <laughs> So a year after this, Augusta had a stroke and was bedridden where Ed would take care of her basically 24-7 when he wasn't like doing outside jobs or taking care of the house. This didn't stop her from verbally abusing him, though, and she even told him that he wouldn't survive without her. Not the other way around? (laughs) Nope, not the other way. When he was literally taking care of her. (laughs) This is like the inception of gaslighting. Oh, yeah. (laughs) As a mom. (laughs) Eventually, she had another stroke, which she did pass away from. This was when Ed was in his late 30s, and he lost both of his parents and his brother all within a span of five to six years. 
That's rough. <laughs> it's very rough. So now he's all alone since, again, he didn't bother to go out and make any relationships outside of his family because he had his mom. Mm -hmm. Like, he didn't need anyone else in the world besides his mom. Wait, didn't we talk about somebody? Oh, we did. Like, casually talk about somebody, somebody's mom who had, like, lied to their kid about, like, oh, you're allergic to candy. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Like, I think like, it was the last episode. I think we talked about it in We the did episode. talk about it? I want to say. Oh, I thought Yeah, we where she lied about her being allergic to, like, all the bad stuff yeah and then she eat. wasn't allergic ever yeah she, the mom's just like i just wanted to you to be healthy because i guess the mom's brother had like he was very overweight mm -hmm. and he had diabetes and i think that's what he died from mm -hmm. and so that's why the mom was very like oh you're allergic to everything because she was so scared that God, her kid was gonna do it do the same thing <laughs> you can't go out and hang out with these people because they're <laughs> the devil yeah. and now your mom's dead like, oh, fuck. <laughs> now what now what do i do <laughs> So now that he had the home well, all we're about to, to find himself, out he did. yep, <laughs> he had the home all to himself. Now he left his mother's room like as it was, as she left it. So it looked like she was still living there. Mm. However, the rest of the house was a mess. <laughs> so I put pictures for just to see. Uh, you could tell that it's pretty gross. <laughs> he had trash everywhere, boxes, furniture. Everything was covered in dust. He would only go out of the house when he needed to run errands or go drinking to the local tavern. Mm. So I can't help but think that this man must have smelt <laughs> horribly. He probably had some stanky B.O. Yeah, because like it said that he would mostly hang out in the kitchen because the rest of the house was so crowded. Mm. Like he would if he was here now, he would be in an episode of Hoarders for sure. <laughs> oh, man, he'd be like the king. Yeah. <laughs> and then I guess the king. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> so the owner of the local tavern that like everybody in this town went to, it's a super small town. Mm -hmm. Like um, there's stock footage because I did watch uh, Bailey Sarian video, which I told you about mm -hmm. her. She's a YouTuber. She's really good with all this. So I got some of the information from her video, but some stock footage from it, it showed the population of being like eight to 900 people. Oh, that's so small. Yeah. So Everyone's everybody knows her. each other. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So the owner of the local tavern, her name's Mary Hogg, or her name was Mary Hoggin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she went missing one day and all that was left behind was a pool of blood. So like they were kind of just hanging in the tavern, the locals and Ed, and he made a joke saying that she was staying the night as, at his house. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I, like I mentioned, it's a small town. So again, everybody knew that Ed's like the weird guy. Yeah. Ain't no way you're getting, what is it? Mary? Oh, yeah. Mary. Uh -huh. Ain't no <laughs> way you're getting Mary into Mary's pants. Mm -hmm. But because of that pool of blood, it's like it kind of made it a little more sinister. Like, oh, she's at my house. Like after she left blood behind. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so they're like, OK, Ed. <laughs> uh, that's, it's too soon, bro. Yeah. Like it's like, OK, it's a weird guy, but we don't think he'd ever do anything. Mm -hmm. Like that's the, that's what everybody was thinking. <sighs> so if I was in the tavern, though, and he made that joke, I'd be like, ha ha. And like go out the door, <laughs> like go to the police. Like, Bye. yeah, he said some weird stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a while after this incident, Bernice Warden went missing in 1957, and she worked at the local hardware store, and her son decided to stop by one day after the, he went deer hunting, but he didn't see her in there. And he thought it was weird because the doors were locked, or weren't locked, I'm sorry. So they were open, like anybody could walk in. And at that time, it's like when one person was in the shop because you didn't need any more, because obviously it's a small town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rush hours, like four people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's like, this is weird. Like all the doors are open. So while he was investigating, he did see that there was a trail of blood from the register to the exit door. And he also saw a receipt that was made out to Ed. Like, it was on one of those stacked ones, like, you know, that restaurants have. And his was the top one. So he's like, he must have been the last one because there's no other receipts mm. there. And um, this fool was a sloppy fella. He, yeah, he was like super sloppy. Mm -hmm. Like with, well, with Mary, spoiler alert, he did kill her. <laughs> he left behind the blood. And now he left behind blood again. So her son, obviously, he went to the police and he told him about this receipt with Ed's name. And the police went to the store, they investigated, and then they headed over to Ed's home to question him. When they got there, not only did they find Ed, but they also found the body of Bernice in a very graphic way. Ew. Yeah, I'm not going to be mentioning it because it's it's a lot. So if you're curious, just I mean, if you've seen... Just look it up. 
wait, <laughs> have we gone that far yet? No, never mind. If you've seen certain movies. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, it's very like, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like the Saw movies. Um, Oh my God, torture porn. It's very like you would see that in those kinds of movies. I I have virgin eyes, Cecilia. I don't believe that. <laughs> but, you know, I will say this. One of my favorite scenes in all the Saw movies was when they dump her into a pile of needles and she has to find oh. like, and you just needles all over the place. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, people with money do that. Well, they pay to do that. <laughs> like acupuncture. <laughs> It's different when it's willingly <laughs> and not filled with random dirty <laughs> Anyway. Hepatitis. <laughs> the officers were horrified at what they found, so they called for backup. And once more officers arrived, I believe it was like up to 10, mm. they got to searching the rest of the house and the farm. What they found again, it was horrifying. So trigger warning. And also, if you're squeamish, just skip ahead. <laughs> <laughs> they found a few human skulls throughout the house. And some had even been like sawed down. Oh, this is awkward. <laughs> so, yeah, picture that. But with the top of it being sawed Ew. so that they could he could use it as like, like a bowl. Cut off like this. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. The bottom of it. So he would. Yeah. It wasn't <laughs> confirmed if he was actually eating out of them. But. Why else would you? (laughs) (laughs) Um, He they also found a chair with skin sewed onto the seat. It wasn't like it was only on where your butt goes, like Mm. nowhere else, which is a little weird. But um, I think something that a lot of people know about this case is the lampshades he made out of skin. I know in high school for my medical class, it was like during the psychological text uh, chapter (laughs) whatever Mm -hmm. and one of the things was we had to do a presentation on a murderer a serial killer and I remember the girl who covered Ed Gein she brought up the lampshades and everybody's like well we knew about it but we didn't know it was from this and some people thought like oh I thought that was just from a movie like I never thought someone actually did that and she's like nope they did he did it (laughs) Uh, where do you hello (laughs) where do you think they got the inspo yeah (laughs) so he had a box specifically to keep noses in he made a pants belt out of nipples. That's disgusting. It is very. And he had faces of women hung up on the walls, and he said it's for decoration. That was he was fulfilling like the Vogue. I don't His know. Vogue, what it. Vogue, Vogue dream. <laughs> oh, which face do I want today? I guess there were other things as well, but again, it's very uh, it's very gruesome, and I don't want to go that deep into it, and mm-hmm. I don't want to ruin your guys' day. <laughs> If it hasn't already. (laughs) So the last thing that I'm going to mention that was found is he made a shirt, (laughs) quote, unquote, a shirt made out of skin. And he even went as far as to put real breasts on them. Oh, Mm -hmm. my goodness. He to match this shirt, he made leggings, gloves and a corset from skin as well. And when he was asked about it later, he said that he would put this skin outfit, quotes, Mm. (laughs) to feel like a lady and to try to be his mother. Eventually, they did also find Mary's face there as well, the tavern owner. Mm -hmm. And he also did confess to killing her and Bernice as well. Um, He... He confessed to Bernice's first, and then it wasn't until a few years down the line, like when he was already locked up, that he's like, "Yeah, I was like killed, married too." And they're like, "Yeah, no shit, her fucking no, she she was in there." (laughs) Oh my gosh, um, you know he he would have been an amazing art designer, like a DIY guy. You know, Mm -hmm. back in the day, like that movie. What was the movie that they did? An alien movie called like The Thing, I think. Yeah, with John Carpenter or John Carpenter carpenters <laughs> but they were he would have been like excellent for um practical practical effects but um nope <laughs> he <laughs> decided to go elsewhere a whole different direction with that one yeah so that's two women that like they for sure knew that he killed but the police were thinking what we were all probably thinking mm-hmm. well it takes more than two to get everything that was in the house considering there was just nine faces alone yeah So after Ed's mom died, he started making visits to the cemetery nearby his home, and he actually made a friend there who helped him dig up bodies of deceased women. 
So they were some body snatchers. The friend didn't participate in anything that Ed decided to do after he took them home. Mm. So he wasn't involved in like the skinning and all that the stuff. Yeah, he just, and I'm using the word just very lightly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He was the one helping him dig up the bodies, but I don't think he ever got like caught or anything. Ed was just like, yeah, I know a guy who helped me out. <laughs> this goes back to when we joke around all the time. We're like, yeah, I got a guy. <laughs> Everyone has a guy. Yeah. So Ed said that the reason for going from body snatcher to murderer is that the skin of the deceased was too dry and it made him hard for him to sew them together. So he wanted something fresh. <sighs> First world problems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He was eventually charged with one count of first-degree murder because if you remember, he didn't confess confess to Mary's murder until later down the line. Mm -mm. But he did plead not guilty for reasons of insanity and he was sent off to a state hospital for the criminally insane because he was unfit to stand trial. He ended up going to trial 10 years later and he found... He was found guilty. This guy, though, I really do think that he was nuts. Yeah. Because even when the cops showed up, he was super calm about everything. Like, he wasn't freaking out like, oh, I was caught. Like, I think they asked because a body part was taken off of Bernice and they asked what he was planning to do with it. And he literally, he was just like, I was thinking of hanging it up as like a decoration somewhere here on the wall. Oh, yeah. He was, he was nuts. Yeah. He was like, mm-hmm. so he was in a mental in- institution for the rest of his life and was actually considered a model inmate. Like he never gave anyone problems after he got locked up. Well, you know, when you take everything away from someone yeah. and give them padded <laughs> walls. Mm hmm. He ended up dying in the institution at the age of 78, and he was buried in Plainfield, which caused a lot of tourists to come by, and it's a small town, so everybody's like, we don't want to be remembered because of this guy. Great. We're (laughs) those people. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what (laughs) it is. So some people even, like, they visited his headstone, and they're like, let's break pieces off of it. (laughs) And it's not, like, clear, because you know how there's those weird sick and twisted people who idolize killers and murderers so a lot of people thought that's why they were taking pieces of headstone because they wanted a piece of him and eventually someone just took the whole freaking headstone (laughs) they like took it all off yeah and they found it in seattle (laughs) that's far yeah Mm -hmm. after this they're like he's not getting another headstone also Our taxpayers' dollars don't need to go there. (laughs) (laughs) So he's buried. It's his brother, him, his mom, and his dad. And he's the only one without a headstone. It's like a little gap there, but Uh, he's he's there. A little patch of dirt. (laughs) So that's the story of Ed Gein. As I mentioned before, many well-known horror characters are based off of him. The three most well-known ones are Leatherface. That one's pretty self-explanatory, you know. He wears his literal face. (laughs) Um, Norman Bates, if you weren't aware, he also has an inappropriate relationship with his mom. And Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lamb, the skin suit. Those are all really good. Those were really good movies. Yeah. I think some of them went on to, well, no, Norman Bates got a show. Yeah, Bates Motel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Psycho and Bates Motel, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that all being said... Uh, <laughs> we're going to go to a bit of a more happy place. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to dive into how Halloween is celebrated now in other places outside of the U.S. Ooh. <laughs> Indeed we are. <laughs> um, we're not going to go over a bunch of places. No. We're just, we picked each one and we're like, how do you, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, have you watched Coco, Cecilia? I have, multiple times. <laughs> this is all you got to know about the other Los Muertos in Mexico. All right, that's it. Next time. That's it. <laughs> did you sloppily cry too? I did cry at the end, yeah. <laughs> okay, well then this is really all you need to know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but seriously, I wasn't initially going to pick Mexico for this segment, but after reading an article, I was intrigued. Yeah. Uh, I was also like, oh, hints, Hmm. hints, the outfit. So why not? (laughs) I had it. What is it? I have it. I want it. I don't know what Ariana Grande said. Oh, I want it. I bought it. (laughs) I have it. I wore it. (laughs) Anyway, this is more. uh, Wow, I typed it in really fast. There is more. (laughs) There is more to the other Los Muertos and face paint and sugar skulls in Mexico 
comma, <laughs> Day of the Dead. Well, days, kind of. Mm-hmm. Multiple. Multiple uh, is celebrated to honor the lives of the ancestors uh, and to acknowledge the revolving cycle of life and death. So not necessarily to be stereotyped as the Mexican version of Halloween. Yeah. It's a whole mm-hmm. different tang. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2008, the holiday was added to UNICEF's list of intangible cultural heritage as a defining aspect of Mexican culture. Mm-hmm. So it's official. <laughs> uh, they celebrate Halloween Western style like most do, but in a way, the party just keeps going and uh, <laughs> the motivation behind the partying changes. Okay. Uh, this is probably the worst attempt at a comparison ever, <laughs> but I would say it's kind of like the hair on the dog, hair of a dog. <laughs> you know, when you were out drinking and then the next day you feel like shit mm-hmm. and you're like, well, I guess I just need another shot or another <laughs> blood, Bloody Mary of what I had. So that's what it is. Okay. It's basically not necessarily getting messed up again, but getting an, a little bit of it yeah. just so you can kind of heal. Hold okay. yourself over. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I feel like that's kind of what that is. Like we started on the mm. 31st and it's still going. <laughs> Dia de los Muertos, one of the world's most distinctive holidays, is the result of hundreds of years of blending between colonial and native cultures. The festival's roots stretch back nearly 3,000 years to the ancient traditions of Mexico and Central America's indigenous tribes, often grouped under the umbrella term Nahuatl, primarily the Aztecs, who saw death as an ever-present part of life. The Nahuas people believed that after death, a person had to make a journey of several years through nine arduous levels in the land of the dead to reach Mictlan, the soul's final resting place. Hmm. Do you think maybe? Because you know how it's like the the rings or the layers of hell or something. Mm-hmm. Do you think maybe that's what it is? Like wherever mm-hmm. you give up, that's where you end up. Maybe. And that's why you end up in, where, where is that weird place? Uh, oh, purgatory in the yeah, middle? Yeah, purgatory. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Look, when I die, I just want to be done, bro. <laughs> like, like, I have no desire to hike through several years and nine levels of land. I'm good. I already <laughs> live this life and hike through stuff. I'm done. Yep. <laughs> Put a fork in me. Uh, they originally celebrated in August, believe it or not. Mm. They would leave their d- deceased offerings of tools, water, food, things to aid them in their otherworldly travels. Um, however... When Spanish conquistadores came to America in the 16th century, they brought Catholicism with them. And as you know, their iron will. (laughs) In Europe, All Saints Day and All Souls Day were celebrated in the first two days of November, Mm -hmm. which is why it got changed from August to November. (laughs) It was believed that one of these days, the dead would return to their family members and the offerings were meant to help them feel welcome. Mm -hmm. So when Catholicism was brought to Mexico, All Saints and All Souls Days collided with the original Aztec holiday And Dia de los Muertos was officially born. Mm -hmm. Customs vary across the country, but core traditions remain the same wherever you go. People erect and uh, decorate ofrendas, altars, with pictures and mementos of loved ones. Papel picado, elaborately cut paper banners, are strung from ceilings. Participants often paint their faces to, to resemble skulls or dead versions of significant Mexican historical or cultural figures. And um, best known is La Calavera Catrina, an artwork created by Jose Guadalupe Posada in the early 1900s, which is a folk icon, which is why you always see like a certain look. Mm hmm. It is a joyous holiday. During those two days in November, it is believed that the borders between the spirit world and the living are at their weakest, and the dead are able to return, to drink, and dance, and feast, and, well, live it up, if you will, (laughs) with their relatives, just kind of like when we do during the holidays with our families. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, bringing back Coco, (laughs) Mm -hmm. because in the movie, they could only get out if they had a picture up, right? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So put your pictures up, man. Put your pictures up, man. <laughs> it's like a passport. <laughs> they just want to party one more time. Mm-hmm. And my brain was like thinking of that song, like one more oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since all the food and drink can't literally be enjoyed by 
the departed, the living partake in the ceremonial foods while dressed in their elaborate costumes. So in Mexico, here are the most lit spots. Hey, mm. uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but Hanitizio? Oaxaca. <laughs> I know, I was waiting for you to be like, maybe. Anyway, Oaxaca, somehow I knew that one. Merida and Mexico City. Mm. So in Hanitizio... Hanitzio. Hanitzio. I want to say Jacinto, but that's not right. Han, uh, unless, because I know the, I don't know, Spanish is weird. I know. <laughs> sometimes it looks like it'd be pronounced like a T, Bro. but sometimes it's silent. <laughs> did you have to take Spanish in high school? I had a choice, but I did take Spanish. <laughs> okay. I got like a B minus. My first year I got an A mm -hmm. because I was the only kid in there that actually spoke Spanish outside of the class. <laughs> And the teacher was like never there. It was always a sub. Mm -hmm. And we had one sub that was there for like months. His name, I remember his name. It's Mr. Was his name Louis? No. <laughs> it was Mr. Soto. Mm -hmm. And he like he would always like ask me, he's because the class, it was a mess. Literally, people would not be paying attention at all. Like it's one of your the stereotypical ones in the movies. Mm -hmm. And then my second year, because you need to take two to graduate up mm -hmm. there. I'm pretty sure it's the same everywhere. But I had a teacher, which was interesting because she was white, but mm. she knew Spanish very well. And I because you know how it's different. Like when you grow up, it's like it's a different type of Spanish mm -hmm. than what they teach you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's it's I don't know. You learn very proper in school. But then the at world, home, it's like it's Spanglish. Yeah. It's Chicano. <laughs> so there will be times where I'm like, I say something and she's like, what is that? And yeah. I'm like, uh, is it not the same thing? She's like, no. <laughs> Why are you offended that I know Spanish slang, ma'am? Yeah. But that, uh, yeah, that second year teacher, I didn't get along with her. <laughs> mm. Boo. <laughs> well. Anyway. <laughs> well, no, I am reliving now. I used to sit next to two other Jessicas. <laughs> so it would be three of us in a little blob. A trio. <laughs> uh -huh. It was accidental. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would yawn. And so then they would yawn. Yeah. And, and then it was a yawning party in the back of the classroom. And they're like, Jessica, stop yawning. You're <laughs> getting everyone to yawn. I'm sorry. It's fucking second period. There, Yeah. But there's a science behind that, though. Like, it's contagious. When yeah. you see someone and it's like, you you do it after. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I wouldn't stop. <laughs> in Hanitzio, thousands gather at the cemetery and watch indigenous uh Purpecha people perform live, perform lively <laughs> Dia de los Muertos dances, and fishermen in rowboats illuminate the lake with torches. In Oaxaca, it is known to have uh, mezcal distilleries, which mezcal, ooh, <laughs> um, and well-preserved culture. From October 31st to November 2nd, their largest graveyard, Panteón de San Miguel, is decorated with Pan de Muerto, marigolds, candles, and offerings. In Merida, Day of the Dead celebrations are known as Hanal Pixan. I'm pretty sure that's wrong. Pihan. I would say Pihan. Hanal Pihan. Mm -hmm. uh, or Feast <laughs> for the Souls. Many fam I was going to say familias. I mean, it's, it's right. I mean, I'm not, I, but my brain is having trouble going Switching back. Switching back. <laughs> <laughs> Malfunction. Mm -hmm. um, in the Mayan region, prepare elaborate traditional dishes for the return of their ancestors and in mexico city it can go as long as a week so they're they're getting lit all week mm -hmm. uh, performers dress as alebrijes mythical creatures or the calavera catrina on the outskirts they decorate the canals and chinampas and which are floating gardens mm -hmm. <laughs> i was like what is that <laughs> and they also decorate the gondola boats mm -hmm. so those it are sounds like, like a whole row in the in loteria uh huh. Yeah, doesn't it? It's like, when <laughs> if you play the yeah, because I I realize that not everybody does uh, how my family does it. Mm. So it's we do two in one round. Mm. It's like if you get four, like diagonal straight down, whatever. Or if you get the four corners, that's one. Mm. And then the second one is the whole card. Oh, mm -hmm. you guys do both. We do two. So we start the first one. You just need four. Either diagonal, straight, down, mm -hmm. or whatever. <laughs> or the four corners. That's a you could win that, win the money. Uh -huh. And then we go on from that. We don't reshuffle the cards or anything. We just continue Whoever and it's the next first. full card. Oh, uh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. 
they take money. They get as much money as they can. <laughs> Man, why don't we use money? We use beans. Oh, we use beans for like placing it, but everybody puts a quarter to play. <laughs> uh, you know, that would have been perfect during COVID time, like heavier COVID time, mm -hmm. just because there were uh, quarter shortages. Oh, so right. Really mm -hmm. bad. And people were like, I need quarters <laughs> to do laundry. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> that would have been the time. All righty then. Well, goodbye, Mexico. Goodbye. <laughs> Hello, Switzerland. Mm. I was doing some digging trying to figure out what part of the world I wanted to do. And I found that Switzerland doesn't really get into Halloween. Mm. And if you've been listening to the show, you know that I do want to live there. <laughs> so it's a little heartbreaking womp, womp, that they don't womp, womp. celebrate. But <laughs> they do participate in like the fashion and the decor so like you'll be able to find the stuff in the shops but celebrating it they don't really care for it mm. this does make sense though since halloween didn't really become popular in switzerland until like when i was born mm. so 21 22 years ago <laughs> um it did they kind of look at it as why do we need halloween if we already have so many mass carnival festivals like we don't need another one <laughs> Which I is mean, pretty, it's pretty cool, okay. but like there's always room for more. You know, this makes me think, I've never been to one of those masquerade parties where people are like wearing. Oh, okay. I don't think I have either. I think I've like, like Halloween parties and some people dress up as mm -hmm. it, but not a full on masquerade party. Hmm, should we throw a we toxic should. sips? Let's do it. <laughs> Launch party. One of these festivals <laughs> is Fashnap which is a carnival full of people in costumes, bands playing music, food, drinks, and just fun activities all around. According to an old Germanic sacrificial practice, during Fashnot, you should drive away demons and celebrate the end of winter. All of this is very similar, like traditions-wise and the reasons for it. It's all pretty similar all around the world. Yeah. So this actually isn't celebrated in October, though, but it could be celebrated as early as November or as late as February. It really just depends on which area of Switzerland you're in. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they're they're just doing their own thing over there. You can go on a tour between November and February <laughs> partying. Yeah, essentially. The customs and traditions that happen in the festival also vary from region to region. Similarly to Halloween, the nights between winter and spring are a time when evil spirits roam around. It's mm. when that veil gets a little, like, not close, bigger. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the period also welcomes a new life and an awakening of nature. It's all about saying goodbye to winter and saying hi to spring. But that's interesting that some people start in November. <laughs> right. <laughs> in addition, just before the period of fasting or if more religious folks call it Lent. Mm. When that begins, people use up the remaining, remaining, remaining <laughs> winter stores okay, and having make them. a joke. Mm -hmm. And hipsters call it intermittent fasting. Now. Oh, intermittent <laughs> fasting. <laughs> yeah, they use up the remaining winter stores and have themselves a feast, kind of like sewing, if you remember from the first episode. Mm -hmm. The types of costumes that you see in the festival are more scary and focused on the supernatural compared to like costumes you see here in the U.S. Like adults some of the popular ones are the nurses the cops SWAT team whatever like that kind of just they do with actual occupations yeah. but over there they're wearing like demons witches gestures animals and other supernatural beings furries furries <laughs> <laughs> they never said what kind of animals hey. <laughs> carnival participants walk through the streets with beautifully colored lanterns and while big bands Or Guggen, which is a Norwegian musician. They play out of tune music, which is interesting. The louder, the better, they say. All right. All right. <laughs> they do use pumpkins in some regions, and they put a candle in them like we do here. They either use a pumpkin or a lantern, and the light is said to chase away dark spirits. Mm. So the Swiss also love their candy. And when I visited, I tried some of their chocolate, and it was Very delicious. delicious. They take care of their cows there. Mm. <laughs> um, packed neatly in colorful wrappers, you can give away chewy candy, chocolate sticks, branches, malt Napolitan. Napolitan? Uh, where was it? You said Napoleon. Yeah. <laughs> But now uh, I see a T. Oh, Neapolitan. <laughs> a Neapolitan? I don't uh -huh. think it's like. <laughs> it's Napolitans. 
what is it? Mon <laughs> Napoleon. Whatever that is. <laughs> Natural <laughs> hazelnut chocolates, chocolate ladybugs, and other melting Swiss specialties. So cheese and chocolate is what they're known for. <laughs> mm. But also, I think at that time frame, because it's cold, it's comforting, oh. and it won't melt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's just one of the festivals they celebrate. As they said, they have plenty of them going on all year round. Mm-hmm. So I even think they have some going on during October where they're like, yeah, but it's not Halloween. Yeah. Like it's not Halloween focused. But the rest, they're all kind of similar with their own traditions. Of course, they're not all the same. But if I explained them all, we'd be here for hours. And I think our time is up. <laughs> yep. So moving on to our horror movie trivia question for today. In Scream, what is rule number one on Randy's list of rules for surviving a horror movie? Do I answer this this time? I don't know. No, right? Because I'll give it away. Yeah, on the next one, in the beginning of the episode, we'll answer. Well, all right. Yep. So thank you guys for joining us on Toxic Sips. Again, we're not experts on anything we said. So all of the links that we got our information from will be in the description through our website. And if you would like to follow our podcast on any social media, basically, it's at Tox and Sips, not Toxic Sips, at Tox and Sips. <laughs> and for our personal accounts, mine is at Sessie.ncso. Mine is at jfox with two X's and two underscores. You had like a crash or something behind you when you said that. I know. It's like X's yeah. and underscores. <laughs> it's like those commercials where they're yelling and it's just a bunch of stuff going <laughs> Explosions on. in the back yeah. and stuff. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. oh wait, sorry, microphone that doesn't like B's and P's. <laughs> but, <laughs> before we go... <laughs> <laughs> uh what you sipping and what are you sipping out of and what's happening well let me put let me let me put this back together oh yeah there's a thing mm-hmm. this is a cute witch's cup oh yeah so it has the witch's leg sticking out under it's a little polka dot and then it has if you hear all that clinging uh-huh. <laughs> and oh. more clinging oh my goodness it's a witch's hat that goes on top to cover it Oh, cute. Protect also, your drinks from flies. <laughs> yeah. And then Matt also got me these spoons, these little skull spoons. Very so cool. Mix it up. Yeah. Next up is the pumpkin spoons. But <laughs> You know, have you seen the ones, the black ones that I have? I don't think I've seen the ones you have. I sent, oh, uh, I sent you a picture of it yesterday when I was like, inspo. And it was oh, like, the, it's the pumpkin ones, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I want those next. They're freaking mm-hmm. cool. And I am drinking a pumpkin spiced coffee. I was my barista again today. Uh, and I'm yay. getting better each time. <laughs> yeah, the, it's it's a mix because they're not just doing pumpkin. They're doing like something with vanilla yeah, and uh-huh. some other shit. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, let me take it into my own hands. So Obviously, I'm still going to go buy it. but Potion. Yeah. So it's really good today. Yeah, it's super cute. Yeah. What about you? Um, I am having a pumpkin cream cold brew out of the exact same cup that you gifted me for my birthday. I did. It's just inverted colors. It's just inverted colors. The hat's the same, but the mug itself. Oh, the hat is totally the same. Yeah. The mug, the handle, yours is white and black. Mm-hmm. Mine's orange and black. Yeah. And then the, what would this be called? The actual mug? The, yeah, the mug portion. So yours is white with black dots mm-hmm. and then mine is orange with white dots. Mm-hmm. What do you, are the legs the same? The legs? Oh, no, they're different. No, yeah. Wow, that's attention <laughs> to detail. Guys. <laughs> this is why they get paid the semi-big the big bucks. bucks. <laughs> <laughs> also, their little boots. Yeah. Isn't that cool? <laughs> anyway, well, if you guys are just listening to the podcast, you guys should definitely watch it on YouTube yeah. because we have a bunch of cool decorations all around us mm-hmm. that we purchase. So it would look rad with what we're talking about. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, this uh, and it has like foam. It's really good. Mm. Uh, you know, usually I, I try to do not too much sugar in my coffees and stuff, mm-hmm. but when it's PSL season, oh, baby, yeah. that goes out the window. Out the window, <laughs> just get rid of the whole window. Give me all the sugar. All the sugar. <laughs> I know. Yesterday they're like, yesterday it was like, oh, do you want anything else to drink mm-hmm. uh, outside of a vodka tonic? I'm like, no, mm-hmm. sugar, man. <laughs> right now I can only make room for the pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the water and the water and, and the water. <laughs> all right then (laughs) okay guys well thank you guys so much for joining us today on toxic sips and bye. bye see you on the next one